All right, Adam, whenever you're Oh, we're ready. Hello. Uh, hey, everybody who's joining us right now. This is Adam Savage. Uh, welcome to Live with Silicon. This is our first virtual panel. Uh, and I'm going to give a full introduction later. But uh, over here, to, no, over here is uh, yeah, my friend Katie <laughs> Coleman and down there, my friend Mary Robin and Kel. Uh, we're going to be talking about spaces. We're going to give everyone a few more minutes to load in to the chat so that we're all here. Uh, and then we'll get started. Very exciting. Mary Robinette, you are reminded of a specific actress, and I'm trying to remember who. Oh, um, did you ever watch Sports Night? No. Sports Night was Aaron Sorkin's first big television show. And in it, Josh Charles plays a guy named Dan Rydell, a sportscaster who falls in love with an accountant in his network. And she, you are a ringer for her right now. Oh. Hmm. I will find a picture and send it to you after. Yes, this. please. Yeah. It's always interesting uh, when I put makeup on, I get told that I look like various actors and I'm always fascinated to see who it is. And it seems to be based on hairstyle. <laughs> <laughs> it's always just hairstyle, right? <laughs> no, it's, it's, hairstyle. it's about the hair though, you know, because yeah. yeah. pretty much all the brunette astronauts, we're all like one. Yes. You know, and yeah. I mean, hair color pretty much does determine those things. <laughs> it's that way. That way is all true. They're doing the tests, right? Yeah. Yeah. It's true. It's true. It's true. Yeah. yeah. You and, and Serena, you're the same person, right? Yes. And actually, um, and because Ellen Ochoa and I play the flute, each of us, um, we exchange a lot of mail. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Yes, I can, I can see how people would get confused there. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> In fact, each of our hometowns, when we each retired, our hometowns each put a picture of the other person <laughs> in the hometown newspaper. <laughs> so my father was a twin. Was a twin. really written on your suit. <laughs> my father was a twin and had a complicated relationship with his twin brother, like many twins. And one of the most complicated things that happened to them as young people is their high school yearbook swapped their photos. <gasps> yeah, that, oh, that's not, not good. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it hurt for reasons that no one could explain in the 1940s. Oh, poor thing. Uh, well, I, uh, uh, I think we should start. I think we should get started. I think we've given everyone about five minutes to get in. So uh, greetings again, everyone who is joining us. Welcome to Live from Silicon. I am your host, Adam Savage, Creative Director of Silicon. And joining me, uh, uh, again, to my left, is musician, engineer, scientist, and astronaut, Hayden Coleman. And below me down there is my friend who is puppeteer, actor, uh, a cosplayer, and author of many novels, novelettes, short stories, Mary Robin and Cal Hi. Hi, everybody. Hello. Um, now, I wanted to start with a story to get us in because I want to go. We're, we're here to talk about spacesuits and the realities of wearing spacesuits. And there's uh, something that happened to me when I was doing cosplay. I'd done cosplay for a few years and I was at a con and I was walking around in my costume and I was sweaty and I was uncomfortable. And I saw this. Uh, this young person coming towards me dressed as a character from Star Wars. And I could see it was late in the day that they were like moving some strap that was integral to their costumes aesthetic. And I could see they were pissed off and tired and sweaty. And I felt a real bond with that person because being tired and sweaty while wearing a costume is, is part of the whole experience. And I don't think many people realize that, that we make these costumes and we make them as comfortable as we can, but we fail. And when we wear them, they're, they're varying degrees of uncomfortable. What I didn't realize when I first fell in love with spacesuits is that spacesuits are really, really hard to wear. <laughs> it's a true statement. <laughs> <laughs> and so I wanted to, I think that there's a lot of commonality between, I, because I'm both a cosplayer and a, a spacesuit replicator and wearer, uh, and Mary, you have worn them and written about them and researched them. Katie, you have worn the real thing. I, I, I wanted to talk about those aspects that most people don't realize are going on behind the scenes, that spacesuits are, are way more complicated and way more uh, of an engineering achievement than I think people really realize. And there's still a long way to go. So, Katie, can you talk about going on an actual spacewalk in a spacesuit? Well, I wish I could do that. But you know, I've actually, so I am one of the people on all three of my missions, 
selected as one of the EVA crew members. If something goes wrong, we are going out. And then, no. Oh, oh. <laughs> I want to put my yes, foot in my mouth. Right but I will now. say that um, you know, basically, since they discontinued the small spacesuits um, after the shuttle program, we had a number of smaller people. Most of them were women um, mm -hmm. in the shuttle program. But then in the station program, they um, just couldn't afford to maintain because it's hugely expensive. The all the sizes of the suits, and so they left out the small and the extra large. That lasted about a month. They brought the extra large back in, but they never brought the small back in. And it, it actually eliminated uh, eight out of the 25 women in the Corps at the time from being spacesuit people. And I don't know whether I'm actually included in that eight or not. I haven't really counted, but um, I just have always grown up with a different idea of eye level. And it never occurred to me that I was too short or too small. And I just kept showing up to those meetings and ended up with above average grades in all the aspects of spacewalking, except I'm a little slower than some. I'm not the speediest, I'm average speed. Anyways, um, so I ended up, I'm, I'm actually quite proud to be the smallest person for the space station to go up there with a suit and gloves and ready to go out. And unfortunately, it's actually not really good. It's not good form to hope that something dangerous breaks. Because <laughs> as much as we're talking about it today, I mean, spacewalking is dangerous. It's an extra risk. There's a lot that could go wrong. Um, so it's not good to hope. And at the same time, you know, it's really can't really help but do that. But I have done a lot in the pool, which is where we practice and we train. And that's where you really get ready. And in fact, if there's gonna be an actual space walk up on orbit of something yeah. unexpected, the first thing they're gonna do after they figure out generally what they're gonna do is put people about the same size in our giant uh, swimming pool with spacesuits, with all the tools and, and everything and figure it out. And th these things are definitely not comfortable, but I think you're so focused. I mean, I would get out after six hours in the water and you'd have like bruises and blood and, you know, <laughs> and you'd be like, wow, I wonder when that happened. Cause it's just a really, it's just a really focused, you just gotta, you know, focused job. So even though it's a love hate relationship, I actually really loved my spacesuit. Well, and as an engineer, I love the idea that got promoted to me at one point that a spacesuit is an anthropomorphic spaceship. Um, and I'm curious about your experience climbing into that spaceship the first time you got into the pool. Um, what was different and what was exactly what you thought it would be? Well, it, it, I like the way you put it. It's basically a spaceship in the form of a human, you know? I mean, because this really is your own spacesuit. It's your own spaceship when you're when you're out there. And there's so much thrill that goes into that very first time. Because first of all, you never believe you're gonna be selected as an astronaut, right? And then you actually are and you show up. I mean, it's just it it's it it's it's actually just one of the most amazing things. But the first day that you go and you have a space suit fit check and and they you climb in, you know, and through the like through the upper torso and put, actually put on the bottoms first bottoms first. And it takes like, you know, two people at least to help get you dressed, right? Because the whole thing weighs about 300 pounds. Uh, anyway, so of course bottoms it's on yeah. and then into the top. And then that helmet on, that's a, that, that first time, that is a claustrophobic moment, yeah. actually. And then, you know, you're so excited and you're on a, you're on a crane. My husband says he's tired of having his wife picked up and moved around by a crane all the time in her job. But <laughs> you're, you're on a crane, they lower you into the water, you're all excited about going to town and then you were like, wait a minute, this is, and, and it really takes, you have to kind of come to terms with the suit. You have to, instead of just going, I can't do this and I can't do that and how come? And it, it's just to go and figure out what could be relaxed right now. What mm. has to be working? And let's think about this. And it's a big mental game, as physical as the spacesuit is. Interesting. So I guess there's a lot of that noise goes away as you get more acclimatized and more practiced in it. Is there still some aspect of the of going in the pool that it, even by the the last time you did it was just like, oh, I hate this part. Um, no. No. <laughs> <laughs> Well, I mean, I will say it's frustrating or just, I mean, there's times where it's just, it's hard to do things. And actually I will say, you know, as a smaller person um, in a really big suit, it's like having a giant exercise ball, you know, and be, and you're in a swimming pool. And so this is not a space problem, right? This is a training and evaluation problem um, where you're in the space, you've got a lot of room in your suit. I mean, I can do the hula 
Yeah. And, and so we, we actually adapted some really interesting um, ideas and they came from actually other, like some of the first early women spacewalkers were like, hey, we're gonna fix you up when you have to get in that big suit and oh, nice. big bunches of padding. I mean, I come out there, I look like Arnold Schwarzenegger. I mean, just trying, I mean, this is with, with the biggest crotch pad in the business, I'm just saying. <laughs> And that's and that's the amount of space between you and the outside, so it doesn't shift its volume on you. Is that right? Exactly. Well, at least down in here, you know. Right. And so and so um, so we stuff a lot of padding in there, and yet there's still just a lot more air volume for somebody who's my size. So that means it's like me and an exercise ball of of air. Is you know, it's just like a big pocket of air that wants to be at the top, but you're trying to do this down here, and it wants to be up there, and and it kind of looks like if you're watching somebody, you're like, why doesn't she just like turn there and do that? but it's actually quite difficult because of the air. And so those measures have really helped. And it turns out um, a lot of people end up being weighed out. Uh, it helps them stay in one place in the suit and it helps the pool act more like space. Oh, so they, so, get, they get brought to a perfect neutral buoyancy, you mean? Right, I mean, cause that's not just about sinking, but or not sinking, but not floating. It's also about like what angle you're at. Oh my God. And, and so it's complicated with the weights and things. It's it's hard it's hard to do, and at the same time, you don't want to always be going. Oh, I don't think I'm weighed out right, you know. So there's some, so you have to figure this out. And um, I'm actually pretty um, proud that some of the modifications that we made for my suit turn out to be actually practical um, for a bunch of people in terms of boy, that was kind of hard for everybody, I guess, you know. And so why don't we make it easier to to actually be able to have the pool feel more like what it's gonna feel like when you get to space. It's interesting that you talk about it also, the institutional inertia of not wanting to raise your hand and go, this doesn't work. Well, you know, it's a it's a big thing, I think. And, and actually, you know, there is this compromise between going along, cheerfully showing up, going, hey, pick me, I love this, this suit fits great, I'm ready, right? <laughs> um, and, and saying, hey, you know, you need to make these for everybody. And uh, I'm pretty excited about the new suit, the XEMU. I mean, they have made a commitment for the journey back to the moon that it's gonna be the first woman and the next man. And I think she's gonna need a spacesuit and they know it too. And the, the new spacesuit has a lot of promise and you know, kind of my soapbox would be that when you're developing anything, you should make sure that you include all the, yeah. all the different kinds of people in the tribe that are gonna participate in that in the development so that you don't end up with something where people are having to kind of jury rig to make it work and, yeah. and think about whether they have to raise that hand. Now, when you, things. When you oh. say that, um, that, the, that, that there are suits on the space station, it's not like there are dozens and dozens of suits on the space station, right? They're, they're, they're more modular than I think most people realize. That's true <clears throat> in terms of like there's a medium, it's, a, it's about the, there's a medium top with a medium bottom, there's a large top with a large bottom. Um, and so they're, they are modular and at the same time, it's not as if they're custom fit. And yeah. it depends where the break is and all those things. And there's only so short that the arms can be, you right. know, that kind of thing and how they're kind of, how the, and you would probably, both of you from your costumes know this. I mean, if somebody else sort of broke that joint in into a different place, it might be hard for other folks. Okay. But in general, they're, I mean, they're modular in a sort of like, all the, there's different sizes of parts and we keep a lot of parts on board. Yeah, no. What were Mary, you gonna say, Mary, Mary, uh, Mary Robinette, were you gonna say something? Oh, it, something I was gonna say about the Artemis suits uh, that I found fascinating was that they decided to design it for the smallest woman, uh, recognizing that it was much easier to scale it up than to scale it down. Oh. Uh, so I, th I thought that was a, a much more interesting approach than, than the way they have been uh, been building it. So they are specifically building it for women and then will modify it for, for broader shoulders. And and the to, to the point that you were just making about the um about the the points where it breaks, this is this is where my puppetry career comes in. Um, ergonomically speaking, you, you want this really big range of motion here, right? And when the the hard upper torso is is yeah. basically like we call those who've never seen one. Imagine a a fiberglass um, tank top. <laughs> so, like a suit of armor, you know. Or, yeah, like a suit of armor, like a breastplate of armor. Yeah. Yeah. So, in an ideal world, you want it. To, you know, you want that shoulder seam to be right here, so you get this this nice range of motion. 
But if you are a smaller person and you're in a medium, yeah, you can get into it. But if you need a small, your your shoulder seam is there. Or if you're in a large, your shoulder seam is there. Yeah. You can't bring your arm forward. So that what that also in turn means is that all of your range of motion, you're having to put extra crank on your shoulder. So you're more likely to get shoulder injuries. You've got more fatigue. You've got a smaller range of movement. And it's it's like it's the Ginger Rogers effect. You're having to do everything the but you know backwards and in high heels, um, yeah. except in space where it could kill you. <laughs> and I actually, to your point, Mary Robinette, uh, Chell Lindgren was telling me that if those because the hard upper torso just has these arm holes and your arms kind of come mm -hmm. out the, the sort of front facing of that. He said if the if the rim is off even an inch, yeah, he like won't be able to raise his arm. And actually because of the bearings, he has to do this very specific motion to raise your arm. So it's already difficult. Yes. And then when this moves even a small amount that's different from your body. I mean, uh, Mary Roach's truism at the beginning of Packing for Mars holds, holds firm here is that humans are the hardest part about engineering for space. <laughs> Interesting. Well, and you yeah. know, we when you were saying at the very beginning, like that all, you know, spacesuits are uncomfortable and and I would say in general, they are, although there is just something that reminds you like, oh, if I'm wearing this, I must really be like, you know, going to space. I mean, so it's so it's pretty marvelous. And at the same time, um, the, the the Russian suit that we wear for launch and entry, and that is not a spacewalking suit. Right. So it's really more soft cloth and all that kind of stuff. But that actually does. They make it, they literally, you know, make a plaster of Paris mold of you. And then they make that suit. And there's a designer that, you know, uses the tape measure of Gagarin and measures everything. And I mean, it's a, it's a beautiful thing. And it's actually, you know, quite comfortable, really. Oh, I mean, so it can be done, but it's just not, you know, in terms of exploration, you know, how and you, you mentioned, Adam, how many suits you're going to have up there. It's not really practical to be custom making for everyone, but maybe the world of 3D printing and of design, or, you know, that there's, you know, or wilder fabrics that, you know, there's different ways to think about making a spacesuit. Uh, it could be a shell that holds air in, or maybe it's something that is compressed, like yeah. David Newman's bio suit. Mm -hmm. um, so there's different approaches, but it's not, um, it's not simple to make enough uh, logistical, logistically enough uh, custom made, you know, for people. Well, I'm impressed with the engineering idea of going for the smallest and then scaling up, and how different that is as a as a as an exercise. Mm -hmm. Internet, Cal, you uh, have written the Lady Astronaut series, and you've done tremendous amounts of research and written about women going to space. And I think Katie is one of your research <laughs> go-tos. Really is yes. I'm oh no, a lot. I'm curious about what was the what was what was the most surprising at thing you learned when you first started asking about what it's like to wear one? So a lot of it was that I, you know, I, I had done my research um, and then uh, I had talked to Chell Lindgren mm -hmm. and he had talked to me about spacesuits. Uh, and then I handed it to Katie and her experience was completely different from his because, uh, because of their size difference um, and what she was talking about the, that it's much harder when you're, um, and this is true in any profession, when you are in a, you know, when you're one of eight people, like eight women, it's much harder to say, hey, I'm having a problem with this. And they're like, well, none of the other hundred people here have had a problem with that. And you're like, yeah, but strange thing. Uh, there are eight of us who have, the, we all have this specific thing. And like, maybe you just can't do the thing. So, but I think one of the things that was actually really su most surprising for me was when I went to watch, um, I got to watch a full dev run, a development run at the NBL, and how much like puppetry it was. Like when, when, um, when they were getting ready to get into the pool, they were doing uh, warm up exercises for their shoulders that are exactly the same ones that I do when I'm getting ready to to work a puppet. When they got out of the pool, they were, uh, I, I remember the moment uh, Chell's glove came off and, and Victor was doing the same, they were both flexing their hands. And I was like, oh my goodness, that is exactly the movement that I do when I've been working a puppet where the mechanism is too stiff. Because you get these real specific uh, fatigue, like through, and, and that was, that was super surprising, recognizing, um, how many, 
you know, that, that what they're doing, it's like, yes, it's a human spa, size, a human shaped spacecraft, but they're also manipulating this inanimate object and trying to make it move the way a person would in order to do the job. And, and so there's this kind of constant fighting of it um, that's coupled with the, you know, the, the war between durability and flexibility. And, and it's this constant battle. And, you know, for me, it's like worst case scenario is something breaks on stage. And for them, it's like, well, death, you know, it's it. <laughs> uh, years ago on Mythbusters, we did some work with a, uh, a sniffer dog and his trainer, and we had them find a bunch of things for a story that we were doing. But the most surprising thing about that episode and working with the dog and its trainer is realizing that a, a dog that works with scent like that that it is a simpatico relationship between the trainer and the dog. It is not just the dog and it is not just the trainer. It is the marriage of the two. And what you're saying about the spacesuit is it's less like putting on a suit than playing a musical instrument. Like you've got to be able to make it do the things that you want to do and you have to learn how to get it to do that. Is that kind of accurate, Katie? Well, I, I think it is. And I, th I think that you know, it's almost like, you know, you are wearing the suit, the suit is is wearing you. And, and I think it's interesting to think about different professions where, especially when you, you were making the hand gestures, Mary Robinette, where um, gloves are certainly one of the hardest things and especially, you know, maybe one size of, of glove thing, which is then pretty big for somebody like me. So instead of bending your, your thumb here, you're actually bending your thumb here, right? And so gloves are, you know, something I think about a lot, but if you think then about, you know, different people when they do their work, surgeons, the gloves and medical professionals, the gloves that they're wearing, you know, mechanics. I mean, it, every person that wears a glove or wears, wears a suit to do their work, emergency workers, firefighters, where, you know, they have to be able to accomplish the mission. And at the same time, probably the gear is really, is probably uncomfortable. It's probably hard to, to operate. And it's all about trying to make sure that you could actually just make that a little more seamless to be the person doing the mission, I, not the person trying to really be one with the suit that is, is not. I just doing had to buy, yeah, exactly. I just had to buy new work gloves. Uh, just, you know, just like work, work gloves. Like, and uh, looking these racks of them, medium, smallest they went. Yep. <laughs> and, you know, and like trying to find something that, you know, where my fingers go all the way to the end. That is so hard. Uh, where there's not a ridiculous amount of slop. It's like, because a, a friend of mine who's uh, an electrician and a woman said that there, there are the, I did not know this, there are uh, electrician competitions. And uh, in competition, you have to use the, the gear that they give you. And so she it has to face the decision whether to get docked for points because she takes her gloves off or to get docked for points because she can't complete things as quickly because they only go down to a medium and she's got small hands. Yeah. You know Something what? I found really fascinating was I, I did actually have some trouble with spacesuit gloves that they, they were made for my hands, but um, and both of you do a lot of sewing, right? Yes. In fact, Adam, you have a brand new sewing machine that you're very excited I, about. I'm actually, the XEMU is the next spacesuit I'm making and I bought a sewing machine just to do it. <laughs> so I'm mocking up my hard upper torso out of cardboard when I get back to San Francisco in a couple of weeks. I can't believe the three of us get to be on this thing together. Um, but what I was gonna say about that anyway, gloves right? was that they were used to using the same salvage, the same amount of extra oh. when they made these gloves. And so even though my gloves were quite small, they actually became, actually they were made, they were too small even for me. And and so actually damaged my hands a little bit. Um, and and so they en I ended up with a hand surgeon consulting. And it turns out that there is a world of people that are consulting for like, he consults for baseball, for hockey. Like, and when you start making gloves for these sports, I mean, they're really putting a lot of tech and a lot of creativity into that. And, yeah. and so he then helped them meet some of the people in that glove world to, you know, find out, to, to be thinking about gloves differently. And in fact, NASA had a challenge at one point for how to design gloves in a better way. Yeah. And the person or the group that won that challenge were, was a guy that works for, designed the wings for Victoria's Secret models. 
Okay. <laughs> Maybe she was a costume was a designing person. You know? Was that Michael Curry? You know, I don't know the name, Mary. Okay. Kay, it. But I think it's interesting when you cross these worlds, which is why I was excited about being, you know, being on this with both of you in that, you know, Adam is, is making these beasts and showing people what it's like to, you know, really be this person and have this suit and, and just say, I'm going to make this. And that anybody can say, I'm going to make this and, and make a stab at it. And Mary Robinette makes these worlds where people can kind of disappear into the world and feel what it's like to, to be an astronaut in the 1950s, you know, find having to pioneer a way to the moon and the things that she felt. And I, and unfortunately I think that these are still things that minorities and women still feel today of equipment that isn't designed for them, or basically that, you know, what the way they're doing things isn't quite working and they've got a different idea that people don't even understand they could use. Yeah. And, and so when you live that in Mary Robinette's book and, and realize, oh, well, that happened to her. So when I, it happens to me, now I understand a little bit more about it. So I don't know. I just think it's interesting that we're from different worlds, but. But, it, but it's also the, the thing that you're talking about, you know, it's like uh, this, the, these problems, these are also problems that anyone who cosplays faces, it, like women in cosplay, frequently we go to find a piece of equipment that we want to wear and we can't shop it off the shelf. We have to make it because it's, it's not built for us. And that's, you know, like the number of things that I'm like, okay, well, I guess I'm going to make this thing now. Um, <laughs> And so the other side of this coin is when I made a, a I made a Miyazaki character as one of my costumes, and I needed arm length uh, black gloves, and I was getting ready to make them, and then I remembered <laughs> that I live around the corner from San Francisco's drag queen store, <laughs> and I walked in and I said, "You don't happen to have shoulder length black gloves?" And he's like, "You want small, medium, or large, matte or shiny?" <laughs> I love that. That's so good. Do you guys know that the first spacesuits were made by the David Clark Company, which was a company that made bras, mm -hmm. that made girdles and bras and underwear. I, and they're, they're actually I here in Western Massachusetts. And actually, I was on maternity leave and they asked me, they had made, they had finally made, you know, our big orange pumpkin suits. Yeah. Um, they may look like big orange pumpkin suits, but those pumpkins that they make them for have no hips. Okay. So they finally made some suits that were the shape of women. And this was an award for the smaller spacesuit that they made, the orange suit. And so I ended up on maternity leave, leave uh, going over with the baby, and uh, and and actually, you know, having a great time with the women who were given the award in in the conference room. We kicked the guys out, had girl talk. It was great. But I, I think it's so interesting that that's where the tradition came from. That's yeah. awesome. You know, on, on MythBusters, whenever we had to wear safety equipment for a story pretty much almost every time I would go out and buy a version of that. And part of it is I'm a collector and I'm a, I'm a gatherer. Um, and it's taken me a lifetime to realize that my love of safety equipment is equivalent to my obsession with spacesuits and suits of armor. Cause I think of them as all the same thing. Uh, but the having my own version of every piece of safety equipment was simply a safety procedure. If I had it and I owned it and I had adjusted it to myself, then I was that much safer on set while I'm distracted by having to talk to camera at the same time as doing something that might be endangering Jamie's life. Yeah. Wow. I mean, and it's that simple with a glove where your fingers go to the end. Mary Robinette, I am constantly buying gloves. At one point on Amazon, I was like, $50 for gloves. Who pays $50? You know what? I want to know what a pair of $50 gloves feels like. And they're like my favorite gloves. <laughs> oh, yeah. Like gloves, gloves are such a complicated thing to build. And I don't think anyone, like if, if you've never attempted to build gloves, you, you don't have any understanding of how many different pieces are in there and how many pieces of geometry you're having to consider and, and how much of a difference the material makes. Like um, when, we, when we talk about, um, so I also do Regency cosplay. So when we talk about something, oh, it fit like a glove. Back in the day, in, um, when you put a kid glove on, it was supposed to be skin tight. And so you would have to, you'd ease it on, you had glove stretchers that could stretch it out and then you'd get it on and it fit perfectly and because it was kid, it was leather, it would give with your hand. If you attempt to have something that fits like that 
out of something without spandex in it, you can't. Like it just it it won't you won't be able to move because it will the the as you fold forward this part needs to then become longer to accommodate this part needs to get shorter or crumple up and it's this whole thing so then when you're talking about a space suit glove which has multiple layers of material going to say 11 right <laughs> 11. <laughs> and also the other thing to understand about real spacesuit gloves uh, for spacewalking is that that is the astronaut's primary point of contact with the space station okay. right. and and the tools and the tools and also the space station is being constantly hit by micrometeorites and every place it strikes there are little knife like blades sticking up at those impact points so you're also then not just having to touch this thing that is either 250 degrees hot or 250 degrees cold it's also sharp <laughs> but on the bright side <laughs> you're in space. we actually have an extra oxygen tank you literally it was surprising to me but they really prove it to you that you really could actually get a cut in your glove and and be and then you have enough air to take another certainly half an hour to get yourself to the air, air airlock and get inside but it's i mean you just oh, you think that any little hole in that spacesuit, you're just going to be, that's going to be it. But, um, but that doesn't mean it's okay. And actually Mary Robinette, it became a, or it still is a very critical operation. Like when people come in from a spacewalk, the first thing we do is take pictures of their gloves to understand how the gloves have fared and whether oh, those wow. gloves can be worn again. And in fact, you go up with two pairs of gloves, usually a prime and a backup for just that yeah. reason. But gloves are, I mean, astonishingly hard and, and even, um, I don't know, you'd like them to fit at least a few people. You know, they may, basically, the way it works at NASA is that um, you end up, if you're maybe doing a spacewalk, you know, that's gonna, are gonna be doing a whole series of spacewalks, maybe on an assembly mission, then you're maybe somebody that they're making gloves for, they make gloves for me, but they're also picking people that have like maybe sort of average size, a size hand that other people are gonna be able to use those gloves too. Yeah. Um, and so they're, they're trying to work harder at it, but it's it's really, the gloves are one of the biggest issues. Well, and to your earlier point about the fact that it took, it was bra makers that had the institutional knowledge to fit complicated things to soft bodies that yielded the correct solution for NASA. And NASA, you know, when you read into it, they didn't want that kind of suit. They wanted a one size fits all, but humans are steadfastly, no. stubbornly not one size. It's, true. it's um, true. I'm curious, Mary Robinette, about the fact that institutional inertia and what it's like to be a, a woman in that kind of environment is almost a character in your book. Mm -hmm. Is that, is that <laughs> yeah. from the beginning or is it something that came about through your research and understanding? Well, it's a series. It's three, it's oh, actually yeah. three, it's like, it's a whole universe, really. <laughs> <laughs> um, it's something that I was already aware of uh, going in, uh, and then the more I looked into it, the more aware, like the uh, the more pervasive it was. But a lot of the things that I I, I put in there are things that uh, women in any form of STEM experience, but also honestly, women in almost any field. Several of the experiences that uh, that my main character has. Um, so many of them are things that I experienced in theater, but just translated. Yeah. Um, and and some of them are things that it's uh, like uh, that are are things that happened to real women in the 1950s and 60s, and some of them are things that happened to real women who are flying today. So, right. and that was one of the things that was uh, also, I guess, interesting, disheartening. I don't even know the word to use for this, um, but I, I had uh, I had someone at NASA reading it, and it was a guy, and and he said, "Wow, I'm so glad that things like this don't happen anymore." And I ha and I said, "I have to tell you that some of these things, and one of the ones that he had cited in particular, uh, happened to someone you know," and the look on his face, of, like, of. A sudden understanding and horror was was very instructive. I think for both of us. 
Look, I, I have to admit uh, several mea culpas as I was reading your book. And thought, oh yeah, that I can be better that way. Oh, I can be that better that way too. <laughs> you know, I thought I would, I would show just a couple slides just to kind of yes, talk a lot about yes, yes. the suit and what it looks like. Uh, and also, I would like to say if people have questions, they can post them in the chat. We've got a couple here already, but um, we're, we're, we will, we can answer some questions. But go, yeah, let's see those pictures, Katie. Let's see. And I think, is Bill going to put them up here? Yeah, let's put them up, Bill. There, there we go. go. Okay. Um, so I just so th these are the spacesuits that we've been talking about, and this is on my mission. And we were uh, relocating some of them. We had them kind of hanging out while we were uh, doing a whole reorganization of the space station. But you can see them; they're actually these, you know, pretty big, amazing suits. Mine is the one, uh, you know, to my left there, the one at the end, um, kind of short, and it always looks kind of like people with these covers over the heads. Um, and the next one, Bill, we'll just we'll kind of show these in order here. Or do I have this control? Let's see. Maybe I have this control. There we go. Do you there see a new go. picture? Yeah. Yes, we do. Oh. Cool. So this is uh, Chris, uh, Christina and uh, and uh, Jessica Meyer, and the, the, we, so we I think you probably heard a lot of um, uh, you know publicity about the the first all woman spacewalk, and. You know, I, I, it, to me, it's just something that makes me really proud. I mean, they were, you know, two of the, you know, several sp people up there. There were six total, I think, when they were up there. But they're, they were two of the three people that were qualified for spacewalking. So the chances are pretty good that they're both going to be going. And they, and they were wonderfully qualified spacewalkers. And so it wasn't that NASA planned some spacewalk. But at the same time, you know, we've really just come such a long way from the, the earlier days where, I mean, it, it just like Mary Robinette said, those, those, those times still exist that when you're different, it's just, you know, you're sort of different than what people expect. And when things are harder, people are a little bit more sort of looking and wondering and thinking, you know, you know how different is this? I mean, if you just look at the statistics, do you see the graph there now? Yeah, yeah, we see the graph. I mean, I, I found. I mean, I in learning and thinking about these stories and um, and what life was like at NASA when I was still there. Um, I wrote a, an article, a, a, an editorial for Asimov's magazine with a woman named Susan Alsner, who is uh, with a group called Shift Seven, where they basically bring the power of uh, open tech and data to social uh, social systems and, and issues. And so she said, "Well, why don't we just go like do some? We're just going to do a little research." And this graph shows you all the big red lines are the spacewalks that are done by guys, and the blue ones are ones done by women. And I think that that puts the the photo of Christina and Jessica in context. Yeah, you know because you realize that there just haven't been that many. And there's been 104 spacewalkers, at least in June when I made that article, 104 spacewalkers, and uh, 12 of them have been women. And out of the 340 spacewalks there had been, about 10% of those, about 37, um, were women. So there really just hadn't been many women spacewalkers. And the fact that, you know, that we just have so many more now, you look at those numbers for 2017, 2019, when you look at 2020, you're going to see it as well. Um, and, and the fact that there's this emphasis on, I'm going to go to the next one here, and this is the last one, this emphasis for the Artemis program on making sure that we're building suits that fit everyone. Now, all the things that we've talked about today, it's not an easy thing. And I love this picture um, of one of the engineers in the spacesuit. Um, but right next to her is Amy Ross, who is the daughter of one of the astronauts, Jerry Ross, a big spacewalking guy. And Amy is one of the managers of the program. And so to, to, it's, I just think it's an interesting legacy that a you know big guy spacewalker's daughter is one of the people that is in charge of making sure that we're building spacesuits for everyone. And then of course, um, our, our NASA administrator there. So um, I think that's enough. That's, that's probably good on the pictures, but I thought it might kind of ground our discussions where, you know, even though, as, as Mary Robinette said, you know, she had to tell somebody, well, that really does still happen um, at NASA, you know, that people just kind of go, really, are you, could you be like a spacewalker? Do you fit in that spacesuit? I mean, when I, and I'm, I think it's actually still true in some ways where some, somebody that it just seems a little bit more, they just look and feel a little bit more like you when they step onto the pool deck and they climb into that spacesuit and you think, hmm, I'll have to see how they do. 
as opposed to somebody that doesn't look and feel like you. And, and the, the sentiment seems to be like, hmm, I wonder, is she big enough for that suit? Or I wonder how she's gonna do in that suit. And that's not just the smaller people like me, but actually, you know, the, the, the women that are taller and, and stronger as well. And Kirby, so, yeah, it, 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 if, if we're engineering for people to go to space, we're not building any institutional knowledge for half of the people. Uh, or we are building way less institutional yeah. knowledge. And that's just, that's, that's, that's uh, short-sighted engineering. Well, it yeah. really is. Uh, go ahead, Mary Remnant. No, no, no. I was just going to agree. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I was just going to say that, um, you know, we're all different. And, and it's not, I mean, in terms of what you bring to a spacewalk, um, first of all, I think it'd be good to have multitaskers. I am just saying, okay? <laughs> <laughs> You know, I'm stereotyping, but, you know, but we all bring different things to a crew and we bring different things to a spacewalk. We bring something to every aspect um, of, of the mission. But when you think about whether these suits are going to fit, um, we're building suits to fit, you know, the, the moon missions. I mean, this determines whether we have women walking on the moon. Mm -hmm. I mean, if suits don't fit that. They're not going to have those roles and they're not going to be that part of that active work. And it's been proven over and over again that if you want to have a team that really succeeds in the mission and, and more than the mission, because there's more out there than, you know, it, it needs to be made up of a bunch of people so different that, you know, they can't even imagine each other. And yet there they are making more than what they are as individuals. One of the things that, uh, the rankles every time I hear them say uh, the next, the, the first woman and the next man um, is like, I understand why uh, to address historic imbalances that they're committing that, that on that next landing, there will be a woman on that. Why is a guide guaranteed a seat? If it's really not about gender, if it's really about who can do this job, why is that just like next woman and someone else? Right. I think it's like, right. um, this, this is, it's a good week to remember uh, Ruth Bader Ginsburg. Someone asked her, when will we have enough women on the Supreme Court? She goes, when there's nine. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I mean, this is also, this is, this is the kind of bias that engineers work hard to remove from systems. It's not like this bias is the person that did that is bad. It is, we're engineering and we are short-sighted in all sorts of ways we don't expect and don't yeah. realize. Right and we need to get rid of those. Can I, can I, uh, can I do another puppet analogy? Yeah. yeah. Okay. That's so, you have a puppet there, Mary Remini? I don't, actually. Uh, I so often do. I have, I can fake it. You're but I, talk, right? um, I, I have a, I have the, uh, the Sputnik alarm clock, which oh. is a candle that you put up and and but anyway, um, I brought all my space things and I didn't bring my puppet stuff in. Um, so uh, so there's when when you look at the the top performer when you look at the Muppets, it's like this really diverse cast. Um, but when you look below the frame, they're all dudes. Uh, and like Piggy's a dude, Janice is a dude. They're all dudes. Um, they're, they're people I love, but they're dudes. And the reason is largely that Jim Henson was six foot four and he built the sets to fit him. And so when people were coming into audition, the people who did best were the people who were also in the six four range. And when you look at the main puppeteers, they all tend to be right in that range, which is disproportionately male. When women performers are in there, we are wearing clogs that are between six to one foot to, to, in order to get up into height. And because of proportions, our arms are still proportionately shorter than the guys. So even when we get, when we push up so that our shoulder is at the same height, we can't push the puppet as high up into the frame. And none of this was intentional. Like it wasn't like someone said, we're gonna keep women out. Yeah, yeah. But, but right. what it does is it has this, this, uh, th this series of cascading effects. And it's the same thing that happens with any form of design, whether you're designing something for space or for cosplay or what have you. If you don't think about the fact that if you only design it to fit yourself, then you 
forget about all of the people that it doesn't fit. Right. It's, uh, you know, profession after profession, especially when it comes to safety equipment. I mean, actually, even in cars, you know, where the headrests are, is that a is that a level that is actually more anatomically safe for a, a average guy height of head and, and things like that. But um, I think about it, I have a friend who's a surgeon and you know now they have operating tables that are going up and down to make the right height for surgeons of, of different statures. And so it's this process that evolves, but it actually comes back to Adam's, you know, saying, you know, when is it that you raise your hand, given that you can't actually raise your hand in that suit? <laughs> <laughs> you know, but, but, you know, when is it that you raise your hand and, and you're like, hey, this doesn't fit me and, and you're difficult to be, be along with. And then, you know, then there's me who's a little bit more on that edge of, you know, sort of cheerfully showing up and bringing food and, you know, and, you know, even when, <laughs> anyways, um, you know, warming my way in and then hopefully opening that door a wider for, for others. Right. But uh, it's, you know, there's no, there's no recipe. And at the same time with the advances in engineering that we have now, I think that we just need to, we need to start paying more attention to the fact that we could engineer equipment that fits everyone. But the other thing I would say is, you know, just take a, take a look as you drive by a construction site or, you know, someplace and, and look at the different sizes of people and just, and just realize that when you're looking at somebody on a team, you never really know what it's like to be in their shoes, so to speak. Right. And, 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 and that means whether, even if you're all sitting around a meeting table, you know, there's things about what that person needs to do to adapt to that environment, whether it's how they have to schedule their daycare or man or woman, right. Mm -hmm. Or, or what equipment they are dealing with or whether their feet hit, fit, <laughs> hit the floor in the conference room, which often mine don't. Right. Yeah. <laughs> Anyways. So progress to be made. I wish I had answers. Well, uh, what we have is more questions, and we oh, have some good. questions from some of the people watching, and there's some great ones. Um, someone wants to know how you keep the space pants up before attaching the top section. Ooh, you know, um, in so in in the pool, I mean, those things are really heavy, and it actually takes like two people. You 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 lay down on the floor, you pull those things on, people okay. help you up, and then you slither up into the thing, and then they are going. And, and you know, bring in the, it's really heavy, right? Kind of there's space space space. dogs, the dogs have to latch. They're sort of going in and, and mm -hmm. you know, doing a, a motion that latches that. And there's checking. And I mean, cause this is really your safety in the water or in space, right? Um, but then in space, you know, without gravity, the fact that you, you know, somebody can't really shove the same way. I mean, it's really actually can be very hard, especially cause we grow in oh. space. It can be hard to squish those two halves together and because you just don't have the same kind of leverage oh, yeah. in microgravity. So it's, uh, so it, it's, um, it is hard to get the two parts together, but it's not about the fact that they fall down. It's that sometimes it's hard to get them in the right direction. Yeah. Really they, they also have, they, they have handles on them too. Right. So like, they, watching them get into them is like the least sexy floor dance you've ever seen. And then they shuffle across <laughs> and it's like watching a toddler wearing lead diapers. <laughs> um, and also Not Katie, and every time I hear you say, it, and then you slither in, I'm like, and this is a place where Katie's experience inside a suit is very different from Chell's because Chell describes it as, and you jam your way through. And the first time he put his on, he gave himself a bloody nose because it was so tight getting through. Um, so the guys, like, they have to, they do not have, yeah. slithering is not a thing that they do. <laughs> yeah, I can actually, like, pull my arm out of out of the glove, you know, flip the glove <laughs> around. <laughs> you know? I can't quite, somebody could actually get their heart, arm inside and do that, but inside oh, the wow. space. But yeah, no. That, that, that actually would be something I'd want to be able to do so I could scratch my nose. <laughs> right. Yeah, it's really mean to like to you'll know, see somebody in a suit and you, and you just go like this and then they're like like this. Actually, Adam, you asked me about, you know, putting on a suit and what was fun and there's something about doing it in in the pool when they lower you into the pool where, you know, the water's coming up and up and up and often there'll be somebody visiting and if there's times when it's somebody's kids are are there to see, you know, see, see their space walking. And uh and so, uh, you know, I looked on the side of the pool if there's a kid there that I'll go like this as we go as we're going under the water, I'll go <gasps> <laughs> <laughs> when of course you really don't have to blow I have to uh, you know but the, but the first time I went scuba diving and I went through a cloud of of silk I held my breath 
<laughs> Instincts. Um, somebody else wants to know, uh, do you have patch kits for the suits on the space station? Do, can they can they darn a, a, a hole if they have to? I don't I don't know that answer. I do know that I would would want to have you or Mary Robinette on board to do it and not me. Okay. Um, but the, the the bottom layer is this thing called the bladder, and that is really what is stitched together that is the pressure. You know, there's and then there's sort of a casing over that that's to make sure it doesn't the balloon doesn't sort of blow up, right? Mm -hmm. And so um and it would be so unusual to go all the way down to that yeah. level. Yeah. So I would imagine that actually we do have darning kits on board. Am I right that lots of astronauts have lost their fingernails on spacewalks because of the particular pressures of the gloves? Well, it's the same kind. Um, I'd say yes, or um, mostly probably in practice, um, oh. maybe on orbit, and, and, but also maybe on orbit because the suits on orbit are not the sort of worn in old spacesuits that we're using in the pool. They're more flexible, right? And then you get to your actual spacesuit, which is made of parts exactly the same size and the same fit, but they're stiffer. And, and especially the gloves can be stiffer. And just those, you were talking about how hard it is to make things fit. Um, but it's like, I would never, I don't know if you can see my fingernails here, but I would never have my fingernails these, this long right. in a spacesuit wow. glove. I mean, I would, I would, I mean, really, they, they're just down to where you barely see any white. Otherwise, there's just going to be maybe that pressure of pushing on the nail. And it's just like when you're hiking and you can get a black and blue toe um, because there's just this pressure and it's just kind of like always, always, and you feel, oh, what is this? And then sometimes you can have it be so black and blue that you do lose the fingernails. Well, and there's something I want to mention here about these gloves, right? Because we're talking about gloves in different sizes and the fitment and stuff. Um, and when we, when, when you realize and wrap your head around that it's eleven layers, and every one of those layers has a set of engineering drawings and diagrams and discussions and changes, and that for any micro change in the size of the glove or where your thumb bends requires this huge long tail, it starts to become less of a mystery why they cost tens of millions of dollars a piece, and we have so few of them. Yeah. Well, it's true, but I mean, not not even just the fit, but then when you think about the machine inside, you right. know, of, of, of all the different hardware that is scrubbing the CO2 out of your air that, I mean, there's, it's, it's really, and, and to then recertify those things and it's in its fluids, it's fluids in orbit, where if you have air bubbles, they're stopping the pumps. It's, it's, it's a, you know, it's a really complicated spaceship. It really is. I remember actually, I talked about the padding that I wore in the pool, which made it much easier for me to just, you know, not be having to deal with something that wasn't space-like in terms of that big air bubble. So I would wear this big padding and, and everything like that. And uh, and they said, you know, this is really this is really hard because you know we actually have a drawing for elbows to put padding on our elbows, and we have a drawing for shoulders, and we have drawings for knees, but we do not have drawings for hips. And I said. And that's what's so exciting about this, because you and I will be the first ones to sign the new drawings. There, there is this great story from Nicholas de Monchot's book, Space Suit, where he talks about the difficulty of ILC and NASA getting together to make the spacesuits. One of the biggest problems was NASA wanted a change document for every change greater than a millimeter. And the seamstresses at Dover were like, you, you can't do that. It, it, each suit has to be fitted by the by the sewer to the person, and you, there's no possible way you could cover every single millimeter plus change. And they eventually, they almost lost the job because of that. And then eventually, NASA had to agree to kind of okay. So they do have engineering drawings of the suit, but it's like an Ur suit, a hollow suit. There's only one, and it kind of covers a little bit of it. And I'm glad you talked about the people because it's this really wonderful world of people that, you know, we've been talking about how we wish some things were different and how excited I actually I am about the possibilities of what's going on with Artemis and the newer suits where they really seem to have recognized these things. But um, that doesn't mean there's not this wonderful world of people that are doing their very, very best within, as you guys both referred to, you know, really difficult um, bureaucratic documentation that's required to keep everything so safe. Um, and so they have to work within those systems. And at the same time, I mean, you know, I, I, I just sitting here, I can think of the look in the eye of the different suit engineers that I had over the years where there is nothing they wouldn't do to make that spacesuit fit better. 
for yeah. me and to make it so that I would be a better asset on that space station or on the space shuttle. Um, I was also had, I was EVA for my, my flights on the shuttle as well. Um, and so it, it's, the, but it is interesting that it's the people that really make that work. And now I realize that we just really should have been, you know, having people from your worlds be well, making these suits. You know, uh, I got to, I, I have been allowed to wear a spacesuit once. I wore one of David Clark's um, opens pressure suits in a, in a, 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 a Dragon Lady in the U-2 uh, spy plane. Cool. And when I was up there, I got to go, actually my highest altitude is classified, it turns out. And when I was at altitude, I started to think about the gloves and I started to think about pictures of the SOAS in Connecticut. And I started thinking about the tens of thousands of people who are responsible for this machine that I'm in, both the suit and the plane. And I burst into tears. Yeah, I found it really moving because I could tell, I know, because I've met so many of those folks, every one of them was ecstatic about being able to participate in this incredible adventure. Yeah, it's true. Oh, you, yeah, go, go no. questions. Okay. We have one more, we, I think we have time for one more question. And Mary Robinette, it's time to explain the, uh, the Sputnik alarm clock. Okay, so the Sputnik alarm clock. <laughs> so like, I'm, um, I, I will just read it to you. Uh, so I found this at my parents' house. As one does. Uh, oh, really? Uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, so uh, it says, so if you get, if, what you see there, or, oh, sorry, this way, uh, you see a list of times, mm -hmm. right? Um, and then it says, a must for lazy vacationers and fishermen, the Sputnik Alarm Club, world's best, world's cheapest. Information. Just before retiring, instead of placing the Sputnik in orbit, just stick it up your wah wah <laughs> up the line showing the time you wish to arise. Then lie on the stomach, light wick, and go to sleep. Warning, do not wah wah while asleep or you will blow Sputnik out or, if extra strong, into outer space. <laughs> Uh, those of you who have enjoyed the audio book for Simon Eves might rec recognize Mary Robinette's beautiful voice. <laughs> Katie, Mary Robinette, thank you guys so much for joining me on this. Um, as always, I just think the world of you guys and I learn something new every single time we hang out or that we talk in any kind of form. So thank you. Thank you so much. This was delightful. And Katie, I want you to know that I was taking notes while you were talking and you can expect to see that in the next novel. Okay. <laughs> well, and I'm, I think that we've been uh, contributing to the future of uh, future spacewalkers and that makes me really happy. Yeah. Space is for everyone. Can't yeah. wait to it's true. Out. It's true. All right. Thanks guys. Thanks, thanks for raising your hands. Silicon. See you guys at the next event. Uh, and I think that's a wrap. Bill, I think you can shut it down.